So th thank you, Vicky, for that amazing message. It's really true, you know, the, the computer doesn't care about gender. The issues that we have to deal with are human issues, not, not computer issues. And um, thank you for being the role model that you are and being willing to stand up and, and, and do that. You know, when you're not filing taxes and developing apps and running a company, you know, these are precious minutes. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's great that you're devoting those minutes to something important like this. Uh, before I welcome our next speaker, I wanted to say a few things were a, a few things about uh, our, our challenge with, with bias. Um, uh, as a conference organizer, when you think of, so I've organized many conferences, you know, I don't know, maybe 100 or something. Uh, you have to put together, you know, invited speaker panels. And if you just take, it's like when you're looking for directors for a company or anything else, if you just sort of take the first names that just sort of come to mind if you're lazy, then you end up sort of falling into a biased trap that you're listening to the echo chain. And so uh, you have to you have to actually be deliberate and, and think harder. So one of the things that uh, I would encourage everybody in this room and all my colleagues to do is to question when you have a conference with if all the invited speakers are men or all the invited speakers are from the same university or all the invited speakers are the same in some way. You know, maybe they all have the same supervisor or belong to the same school of thought or something. Whenever there's a lack of diversity of any kind, whether it's gender or, or other, really, not, but one of the most visible ones is a lack of gender diversity, it's a really question. It's a how seriously you know, have, have the organizers of this meeting thought about presenting a broad range of, of, of points of view and a broad range of opportunities. And so it's up to us to sort of push back on that and write to the organizers and say, I don't like this. We also have, um, not everywhere, but in some cases, we have a gender-based pay gap. Should be challenging that where it exists and acting on it. Um, so in any situation where women are excluded, we should be acting and not just accepting that. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Kate Larson. Um, Kate is a professor in the David R. Cheriton School of Computer Science at our university, and she's also the Associate Director of Undergraduate Studies. Um, uh, Kate holds a PhD from Carnegie Mellon and a Bachelor of Science from Memorial University of Newfoundland. Her research interests include artificial intelligence and a particular focus on preference modeling and incentive issues in multi-agent systems. Uh, she serves as a general co-chair for the 16th International Conference on Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems. She served on the board of directors of the International Foundation for Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems, including serving as its president from 2014 to 2016. She's been counselor for the Association for Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, that's AAAI, for those of us who you know, like to roll that off our tongue. Um, and is an associate editor of, of several important journals, including Artificial Intelligence, the Journal of Artificial Intelligence Research, and the Journal of Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems. So, uh, welcome, Kate. Okay, well, thank you for coming. Let's see if I get these going backwards. I'll do this, please. Okay. So when I'm going to talk, I was, when I was first invited to talk to you, um, I said I could really talk about anything about my research. And I thought, great, six hours later, I'll still be talking. <laughs> so you know, excuse me if I go a little bit over. But what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about my work in multi-agent systems, in particular sort of highlighting some of the applications that I work with, which, which um, span kind of a wide range of topics. In particular, my work goes from the highly theoretical leveraging ideas from social choice theory as well as complexity theory, all the way to um, working with forest firefighters, trying to understand what some of their concerns are and helping design systems that will help them hopefully do their jobs more effectively. Um, now, I am an AI researcher and a member of the AI research group. And I hate it when people pause and then say, well, what is artificial intelligence and why what you do is AI? 
And because what is AI is actually a really tough question, and inside the research community, nobody actually agrees. But I do have a favorite definition that I'm going to share with you it's by Niels Nielsen, who was a professor at MIT, um, because I think it highlights some interesting um, aspects of AI and particularly allows us to sort of position my work as well as many other people's work sort of in like the right context. In particular, Nielsen said that AI is just an activity devoted to making machines intelligent. I don't think anyone finds that controversial. But furthermore, he goes on to define what intelligence is, which is where things get interesting. In particular, he says that intelligence is just a quality that enables an entity to function appropriately with foresight in its environment. So what's nice about that definition is that it encompasses sort of a lot of different um, approaches. And it allows us to be quite flexible with um, what, not flexible, but it means that intelligence is defined sort of by the context that we find ourselves in. So what are techniques that could be considered AI? Well, anything that is fostering kind of an appropriate behavior in the right, or appropriate behavior in the right context, that would be machine learning, all the way to human computing and crowdsourcing, fall naturally into AI given this definition. Now, acting, um, you know, <coughs> function appropriately actually is, is harder to pin down. It's always changing. And one thing that we find, particularly if we're an AI researcher working in the field of AI, is that the definition of functioning appropriately always is constantly changing. Because once we get a machine to do something clever, we think we have a huge success for AI, then the general public says, oh, but a computer can do that, so that's no longer intelligent or AI. But what this means is that as an AI researcher, we're always working right on the foundation, or right on the frontier of what is possible, and that's an exciting place to be in. So what do I do? Or what makes me get up each morning, well, among other things, is that I'm interested in something called multi-agent multi systems. So in particular, I'm interested in environments where we have interacting agents, and an agent is just a placeholder term that really means stands in for autonomous decision makers. So these might be software agents, they could be robots, they could be humans, or really anything. And I'm interested in how they interact and how we can better support their interactions. And in particular, I have sort of three questions that sort of drive my research forward. I'm interested in how do we make decisions on, be on behalf of a group of um, agents, and ideally that reflect the individual's preferences or values. So I'm interested in questions about how we would do that, and what makes a good decision, and what are the computational issues involved with group decision making. I'm also very interested in strategic behavior, whether this is in game playing scenarios, for example, like you know, creating agents that play poker, or in other different computational settings. And I'll give you an example a little bit later on, it's something that we've been working on. And then finally, I like to design kind of systems that um, can, can, hope, can help support group effective group decision making as well as handling um, strategic behavior and so robust <coughs> according to sort of the underlying application needs. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is just sort of give you some examples of my work which fall in these three areas. Um, and again, all my work is always done in conjunction with others. I love collaborating and I work very, very much with my own team of graduate students. First, just a little bit of, because I'm a, I love lecturing, so a little bit of um, technical stuff, because I wouldn't feel comfortable otherwise. Mm -hmm. We're going to start off by looking at voting and preference aggregation. This has been one theme that we've been working on quite a lot. So what we're interested in is the following scenario. We're going to have a set of agents, so people in the room. Okay? This is my little example. We have three of them. We're also going to have sets of alternatives. These might be candidates in an election, or it could simply be a list of restaurants that we're considering going to after this event. And then finally, we have an assumption that every individual or each agent is going to have a preference ranking over the alternatives. So they're able to say that they like restaurant one more than restaurant two, and another agent will say that they like you know, the Japanese restaurant more than the Chinese restaurant, and so on and so forth. And then given this information, we ask questions like, well, everybody has different preferences, so if we have to make a decision for a group, what's going to be the final ranking? And is that a good ranking or not? What's going to be the winning alternative? And is that the right, is that a good alternative or not? And furthermore, how do we compute the group ranking or the winning alternative? 
and different, different algorithms produce different results. So in, this is an actual topic which has been well studied, particularly in the social choice literature. So we've been taking a more of a computational perspective of it, and so we have a number of projects we are particularly interested in what happens if preferences are not fully um, specified. And there's lots of situations where you could imagine that individuals, again, if they software agents, robots, or humans, are not going to provide full ranking information. Maybe we haven't even considered all the restaurants in Montreal. Maybe you're um, you know, a student who's going on their first co-op term and really doesn't actually know what they want or what jobs they might be interested in and so are incapable of um, specifying a ranking of the outcomes. And the classic social choice theory doesn't actually allow necessarily for the sort of uncertainty about the preferences. So we have a number of projects in this, on this problem. For example, we have looked at if you have just partial information, a little bit of information as to what people like, can we use machine learning techniques in order to fill in the missing information and then make group decisions? And what is the quality of that group decision? And how does the machine learning approach that you're using inter interact with sort of the, the final ranking algorithm or um, uh, outcome algorithm that you're using? And is there sort of what is the relationship between them? We have also used computational complexity as a tool in order to um, ensure that certain voting rules or ways of choosing um, sort of either final rankings or um, sort of winning alternatives when you're doing group decision making are actually robust against manipulation. In particular, what we, we can say things like if agents only have to report a little bit of their information about their top preferences, then we can ensure that certain voting rules or certain ways of choosing outcomes are computationally hard for an adversary to manipulate or swing the election in their particular preferred direction. Whereas if you use other voting rules or other election types, then it becomes very easy to manipulate. I'm also very interested in strategic behavior and then a bunch of projects looking at what we call strategization, but continuing on with voting and going sort of focus on that. I mean, as since we're all sitting in Canada, you know, kind of a sort of a hobby that most of us have is strategic voting during provincial and federal elections. But voting strategically is actually really hard to do, right? Because what do you need to know in order to figure out how you're going to vote? Well, it kind of depends on your view of the entire population, how they're going to vote. And so the, comp the overhead of reasoning about that becomes sort of very difficult. So one um, problem that um, a PhD student of mine, Alan Zan, as well as a, a former postdoc, um, Amarelli Selena Bari, and I have looked at, is what happens if um, our agents or individuals or voters are actually embedded in some underlying social network structure. And in particular, they don't have full information about the entire population, but they do have information about either their friends or they have information from sort of particular news sources, for example. And then we will ask questions about things like, well, if we're running certain voting rules or certain elections, does the underlying social network structure influence um, whether we're going to have strategization, so it's manipulation of what the election outcome should be? Or are there other network properties which are going to influence strategization? And of course the answer is yes to both of these. But, and then furthermore, we can follow up and we can ask, well, is strategic behavior actually good or bad for the society as a whole? Or by society, I really mean the sets of you know, autonomous agents. In order to do that and to run sort of large simulations across um, across our large social networks, we have to have techniques in order to sample preference information. And so we have also been developing um, sampling techniques for social net for particular social networks, um, you know, under some assumptions as to what the preferences might be like. Finally, when we come to designing systems, I just wanted to spend just a minute talking about my pet project. And actually next week I'm going to be unbound, so we're talking with these people uh, some more, so it's uh, a really fun domain. Um, I spend time thinking about forest fires. Um, you know, just a little bit of statistics to kind of give you an idea of the, of the urgency of the problem right now. What we saw in 2009 was actually a really, was the worst fire year on record, um, where British Columbia had close to 2,500 square kilometers burnt. And just cost for fire suppression alone was sort of $400 million. That's not including insured damages. 
What's not included in those numbers was the fact that at the height of the fires in 2009, there was no resources left in Canada to fight them, and they were bringing people and airplanes and equipment from the US and Australia and New Zealand, and even then the fires were out of control. There's a picture right there of uh, the 2000, one of the 2009 fires. 2011 was uh, a quiet fire year, um, except Slave Lake burnt. So one in three people lost their houses there. 2016, the Fort McMurray fire, the offensive disaster in Canadian history, 4.9, almost $5 billion in insured damages. And 2017 was the worst fire year ever, beating even the 2009 fires. There's still kind of, I don't have any numbers there, because they're still sort of sitting there sort of figuring out what exactly the damage was, but people were um, you know, evacuated from their homes for months, for almost a month, not more. So, and the fire models and the climate models indicate that this trend is going to continue over the next few years. We're going to see more and more um, extraordinary fire seasons. So, what I, over the last few years, um, starting for a project that was funded by the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Center, um, we've been looking at how can AI techniques um, help in forest fire control, with particular focus on resource sharing um, across, um, across Canada. And so there's a whole bunch of really interesting sort of AI problems here. So how to model fire, which is a little bit outside of my domain, but also sort of interesting constraints and interesting um, tech, interesting techniques have to be developed to uh, for information elicitation. There's sort of all sorts of interesting incentives that have to be um, have to be worried about in order to design systems that will be able to support the people on the ground when they're fighting these fires. And as I said, that's sort of one of my pet projects. So this was just to give a taste of some of the uh, research which is going on in my research group at um, Waterloo. Um, I, have, I acknowledge I have been able to work for a fantastic group of students, so for our undergraduate, graduate, as well as um, postdocs, and so here's a list of the people who I've worked with over the years. I'd also like to um, emphasize the importance of mentors. I've been extremely lucky to have fantastic mentors from my undergraduate, and I was an undergraduate student, um, all the way up through graduate school and now. And then there's been a mixture of both men and women. I think that mixture has been really important. So they have been cheerleaders and um, sort of found opportunities for me to pursue. And they also kicked me when I needed to be kicked. Um, and I hope sometime in the future, I'll have some student of my own who will be able to you know, post a picture of me. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>